Have you ever wondered how your fruits and vegetables make it to your grocery store? Well, I know all too well. I made numerous cross-country trips delivering produce and meats of all kinds to the markets here in the Northeast from California, Kansas, Texas, Alabama, and Florida, and I have to tell you, it ain't no easy trick. Unlike freight commodities, agriculture and produce are perishable, time-sensitive, and temperature-sensitive. And since the average haul for these delicate items is anywhere from 800 to 3,000 miles, that leaves lots of space for things to go wrong. And in the trucking business, that can mean a refused load, something you don't want when there's 45,000 pounds of product sitting on your trailer. Before the interstate highways made it possible for truckers like myself to make such a haul, the fruits and vegetables of America's farms found their way to markets nationwide a very different way, over the shiny steel arteries that are the railroads of America. The first refrigerated boxcars were introduced by the Swift Meatpacking Company, founded in 1855 by 16-year-old Gustavus Franklin Swift in Easton, Massachusetts. Swift was later incorporated in 1875 Chicago. It was there that Swift began shipping its meat products to markets in the east in unit trains of refrigerated boxcars, ushering in the age of long-distance, temperature-controlled freight transportation. Later in 1884, the Santa Fe Refrigerator Dispatch reporting mark SFRD, a subsidiary of the Santa Fe Railroad, began moving perishable freight in its own small fleet of 25 ventilated fruit cars and eight ice-cooled refrigerator cars, which grew to over 6,000 by 1910, almost that of its biggest competitor, the Pacific Fruit Express. And by 1929, the SFRD was carrying some 100,000 produce loads from the fields of Arizona and California to the East Coast markets each growing season. The Pacific Fruit Express, on the other hand, began operations in 1907 as a joint venture between the Union Pacific and Southern Pacific with a fleet of 6,600 refrigerator cars built by the American Car and Foundry Company, a company still building rail cars to this day. PFE's fleet would eventually grow to over 8,000 cars, the largest fleet of refrigerator cars in America. In 1923, the Western Pacific Railroad joined the mix and leased nearly 3,000 brand new reefers to the PFE. Visually, they were similar in appearance, except for the Western Pacific Heralds on the cars instead of the paired UPSP Heralds, and the three did a brisk business until the late 1950s when the Western Pacific cars were retired and the Western Pacific ended its partnership with PFE in late 1967 and teamed up with the competing Fruit Growers Express. The PFE's assets were later divided between the UP and SP and the company split on April 1, 1978, two years to the day after the formation of Conrail. Ironic since both the Southern Pacific and the Western Pacific were both absorbed by the Union Pacific in 1983 and 1986 respectively, giving UP control of the whole kit and caboodle. That is, except for the WFE, which is now a wholly owned subsidiary of the BNSF. Are you confused yet? By 1926, FGE expanded its service into the Pacific Northwest and the Midwest through the WFE and the Burlington Refrigerator Express, its other partly owned subsidiary that was formed in partnership with the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad. And unlike the WFE, the FGE company is now controlled by CSX. So what started in the 19th century by an enterprising Chicago businessman now keeps food on the tables of America's citizens 365 days a year. Today, Swift is part of a bigger conglomerate and now shares the market with competitors like Cargill, Smithfield Foods, and Tyson Foods, all of which I personally hauled for and all of which use refrigerator reefers to move the perishables to market. The three reefers shown at Anoli Yard are good examples of the refrigerated cars roaming the rails of America today. The one to the left is a Union Pacific Chilled Express reefer that was probably refurbished from an old Fruit Growers Express insulated boxcar. The one in the middle is one of UP's newest and biggest, the 170,000 series mechanical reefers and at right is a BNSF. But unlike in the last century when most Class 1 railroads had refrigerated cars of their own, today there are only two that continue that tradition, the UP and the Bensap. And in addition to the big Westerners, there's also a few private companies that are running refrigerated cars like J.R. Simplot and Trinity Industries Leasing, both shown at Greencastle, Pennsylvania, and Cryotrans on Train 11R moving through Scranton, Pennsylvania. 
Many of the Trinity Industry Reefers are ex bensef cars. One of the greatest freight car innovations of the 20th century was the creation of the refrigerator car, commonly referred to as a reefer. The ability to haul perishables such as fruits, vegetables, and meat products across the country was a major factor in the development of modern America. No longer did food have to be produced close enough to urban areas so that it could be consumed before spoiling. At the same time, Areas with additional capacity for agricultural production could produce more food since it did not have to be sold locally. For many years, reefers relied on ice bunkers to keep the loads cool. After World War II, technological advances made mechanical refrigeration practical for a freight car. This in turn killed the old ice bunkers as a mechanical reefer could be larger than an ice reefer because of the greater cooling capabilities. The use of blanketing of various products came into transportation in the 1970s. Nitrogen evacuates all oxygen in the container and carbon dioxide does pretty much the same. Nitrogen blankets were used by companies that transported very temperature sensitive items such as human blood that would require a low temperature maintaining blanket. Ice cream, which I've hauled myself, is another extremely temperature sensitive product that requires very low temperature containment while in transport, which is why more and more of the railroad refrigerator cars are utilizing systems mounted on one end of the car whose original use originated in the over the road trucking industry. Fruit Growers Express, reporting Mark FGE, was a rail car leasing company that specialized in providing insulated boxcars for the transport of long distance produce and perishables, allowing for the fresh produce to be transported from coast to coast in six days or less. It was founded in 1920 by Henry Spencer, the former vice president of the Southern Railway and owned the largest fleet of reefers in the East. It primarily served the eastern states and with existing cars produced by other manufacturers, the company eventually grew to be owned by a group of 10 railroads across the United States. Atlantic Coastline and Southern Railway were two of the largest original owners. Many of the FGE cars were built at its Jacksonville, Florida shops and by the early 1960s the company was producing rolling stock at their Alexandria, Virginia facility who released a 50-foot RBL boxcar in 1963. All of the aforementioned car types can have cushioned underframes. Also, all of the insulated box cars have plugged doors. However, some non-insulated box cars also have plugged doors, or to put it another way, all RBLs have plugged doors, but not all box cars with plugged doors are RBLs or mechanical reefers. Are you confused, Jet? I suspect that there aren't many XL, RBL, and RPL cars being built these days. The reefers are mostly RP and the box cars are mostly XP. A few other features that you could add to better distinguish a certain type of car are dreadnought ends, rolled ends, exterior posts, interior posts riveted to the sides, or interior posts welded to the sides. Sadly, none of these features are exclusive to or are from a particular type of boxcar with the exception that insulated boxcars will have plug doors and mechanical reefers can be distinguished by the refrigeration unit or maybe the openings and the vents for it. The juice train, or sometimes called the orange juice train, is the popular name for the famous unit trains of Tropicana's fresh orange juice that's operated by several railroads in the United States. In the 21st century, the Tropicana CSX juice trains have been the focus of efficiency studies and have received several awards. They're considered good examples of how modern railroad transport can compete with trucking to carry perishable products. In the 1970s, Tropicana's orange juice was shipped in bulk via insulated boxcars in several round trips per week from Florida to Kearney, New Jersey. Kearney is roughly at the west end of the Pulaski Skyway, right around exit 15 of the New Jersey Turnpike for those who know where they are and what they're looking for. If you are on either road at the right time, you might see a train load of orange boxcars. It ran on the former B&O from Washington, D.C. to Philly, then over the former Reading Railroad through West Trenton to Boundbrook, New Jersey, and then over the former Lehigh Valley from there to the Tropicana facility, which was adjacent to the New Jersey Transit Meadows Maintenance Facility. Starting on Seaboard Coastline south of Tampa, Florida, the original juice train followed the former Seaboard Airline Railroad and Atlantic Coastline Railroad. It crossed over to the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac in Richmond, Virginia at Pier 5 of the famous Concrete James River Bridge. At Potomac Yard in Alexandria, Virginia, Penn Central took it over and operated it under overhead wires with electric locomotives most of the way to Kearney. Today, the juice train is operated primarily by CSX and Tropicana and CSX have a facility in Bradenton, Florida. Loaded cars head out to distribution centers in Jersey City, New Jersey and Cincinnati, Ohio with the cars heading back to Florida as quickly as possible.
and rather than allowing its rail cars to return empty, it operated a backhaul service to ship goods from other companies on the return trips. Tropicana's refrigerator rail cars carry goods like ketchup, carrots, and other food products destined for restaurant chains. I'm also told that Minute Maid has a distribution center. However, their traffic is split between rail and trucks. The common carrier boxes have replaced the billboard trailers, so now all you recognize is the juice. Tropicana juice cars also move over the FEC to and from their plant on the K Branch near Fort Pierce, Florida. They used to hook up to and cut away from the juice train at CSX's Moncrief Yard in Jacksonville with some cars also going west to the City of Industry, California on the UP. I'm told that they used to run on the Q101, Jacks to New Orleans train, but I think that CSX now takes them to Atlanta on the Jacks to ATL intermodal Q154. At Holsey Yard, they were added to the Q145, Atlanta to New Orleans. Q145 became the UP train KATLB, that's an intermodal New Orleans to LA basin, or the CSX Long Beach. KATLB set off all domestic intermodal and Tropicana at the City of Industry Yard. The Tropicanas were either at the head end or in the middle of these trains in the domestic intermodal block for the City of Industry. KATLB then ran the Alameda Corridor and dropped the steamship containers at the ICTF in Long Beach with the empty Tropicana cars returning east on KCIAT back to Atlanta. This is what I've been told, but I have some doubts about the details. Moving on, KCIAT used to have all domestic intermodal containers with blocks for Atlanta, Georgia, Charlotte, North Carolina, and Florida. The Tropicanas were generally at the rear of the train attached to the Florida intermodal block. At Holsey, they get on the Q155 to Jacksonville to the Florida East Coast or got picked up by the 741 to Bradenton. This is how it was explained to me. If you know of a different scenario, put it in the comments. The Cincinnati Juice Cars started moving in 1997 and used to run as a dedicated train twice a week in the 1990s as the K652 and then ran six days per week on the CSX Jacksonville to Cincinnati Intermodal Q142. The Tropicanas were always on the head end. Once in Queensgate Yard, a yard job ferried them to the Tropicana Distribution Center in a suburb of town. The empties came back on the Q141 from Cincinnati to Jacksonville. Keep in mind that everything I just said was pre-Hunter Harrison railroading and in some cases 1990s railroading, so by now most or at least some of this has changed. For example, in 2017, CSX abolished the Tropicana unit juice trains between Philadelphia and Florida. Tropicana products now move on other CSX trains to and from Florida with a separate train for the Tropicanas moving the short distance between Philadelphia and North Jersey. Other changes over the years are that Tropicana is now a division of PepsiCo which became the world's leading producer of branded fruit juices. When CSX acquired part of Conrail in 1999 and all CSX trains started moving to the new larger facility in Jersey City, New Jersey on the National Dock Secondary and even had its own GE 70 ton switcher, the number 98. Tropicana's rolling stock used to be white and then orange and then white again with even some blue cars and came with some innovative refrigeration. Designated as TPIX, they are custom built to Tropicana specifications with additional cars with specially equipped refrigeration systems now traveling 3,000 miles by rail to California.
In the 1990s, a new breed of railroad cars emerged that used cryo-CO2 to cool their perishable loads instead of mechanical refrigeration. A company called Cryotrans, owned by the MHW Group, operated these 70-foot-long reefers. Cryotrans Incorporated, a.k.a. CTI, secured a patent in 1986 for a cryogenic rail car which revolutionized the frozen railroad industry. Between 1986 and 1995, CTI developed long-term leases for approximately 500 of these cars. Today, Cryotrans still operates a large fleet of cryogenic reefers across North America, and while several different types of these reefers exist, they all serve the same purpose. They're used to haul anything that is perishable over long distances. Cryogenic and also insulated reefer cars are something akin to a glorified picnic cooler or a giant thermos bottle, unlike the mechanical reefers, which are more like giant refrigerators or freezers on wheels. The cryogenics used liquid carbon dioxide, aka CO2, as their refrigerant. Liquid CO2 is discharged and flashes to both vapor and snow, chilling the car to well below zero. The snow sublimes for the rest of the trip while pulling heat out of the car, maintaining the cold temperature. If you've ever discharged a CO2 fire extinguisher, then you would have seen this happen. The discharge is liquid which flashes to vapor and snow at ambient temperatures. The cars in the 1100 and 1400 series were used RBLs converted to RCs. Cryotrans reporting mark CRYX bought hundreds of new mechanical reefers from Gunderson over the years which were in the 3000, 4000 and 5000 number series. Cryogenic reefers were not suitable for anything other than frozen commodities, which is why you still saw the mechanicals in operation. They were less complex than mechanicals, and the only thing that rendered them non-competitive was when the liquid CO2 got too expensive. In 2000 and 2001, due to an inordinate increase in the price of CO2, the majority of the fleet was converted to mechanical refrigeration. The Cryotrans fleet has been 100% mechanically cooled for years now, not even a museum piece left as far as I know. The current Cryotrans fleet of reefers consists of 340 64 foot mechanically refrigerated reefers, 1050 72 foot mechanically refrigerated reefers, and 701 68 foot insulator reefers which are the kind that you typically see around here. One of the last shippers that used the old Cryotrans cars in actual CO2 service was the JR Simplot company and I'm talking about the subsidiary out of Portage La Prairie, Manitoba. Today, most, if not all, of the modern CO2 cars have been converted to mechanical refrigeration with the old Plate C 60-foot cars having largely been scrapped. CRYX number 3454 is one of the more rare types. It has no external refrigerator unit and has a 10-foot door. It also has no name on its doors unlike the vast majority of the CRYX reefers. Without the external refrigeration unit, 3454 lacks any cooling source, therefore it relies on its insulation to keep things cool enough. This car is 73 feet, 8 inches long on the outside, with 6,854 cubic feet of space on the inside making it bigger on the inside than most other Cryotrans cars. The newer 74-foot mechanically refrigerator cars are equipped with state-of-the-art two-way GPS systems with all or most being leased to major food processing companies. But there's something else very special about this car. Take a look at that logo. Notice how it covered up something else. Based on the blue excess height bands on the ends and the large patch visible behind the Cryotrans logo, it looks like those might be XGATX Arcticar Cryo Reefers that are now in service as large RBLs, since they would still be well insulated. When I looked them up in the ORER, that's the Official Railway Equipment Register, I found that they're listed as RC class cars with dimensions about what you would expect the Arcticar dimensions to be. So the real question is whether they're still being used as RC cars or as RBLs. The original cars had the red CO2 warning labels on the car sides near the A end. The CSX UMLER lists the car as AAR type R690. That's a cryogenic reefer, but that database has been wrong before. As mentioned earlier, there were other fleets of cryogenically cooled reefers at one time. The JR Simplot cars come to mind for me. The newer JRSX cars, built as reefer series in the 6000 to 6050 and 6100 to 6149 number series, are still mostly in service, minus a few retirees. But the older 5000 series cars that were rebuilt from the old cotton belt box cars have been retired due to the age of the original equipment. And from what I can tell by their car type code, they have not been rebuilt into mechanically cooled cars. Most of the Furex cars in the 690,000 number series, that's FURX, are still in existence. 
the XTRX cryogenic cars in the 200 to 242 number series that were rebuilt from the Western Pacific RBLs are gone though. Lamb Weston, which is a division of the ConAgra company, had about two dozen cryo cars at one point. But when they performed a thermal imaging of all of the cars, they found that most of them were poorly insulated, so they sold them, and the new owners re-insulated the cars and applied mechanical cooling units. The Burlington Northern 751,000 number series reefers were converted Chicago Burlington and Quincy cryogenic cars that were 67 feet 8 inches long and 15 feet 6 inches high with 10 foot doors and a capacity of 4,548 cubic feet. These cars were said to be primarily used in meat service. Originally, the BRMX 5200 number series, the cars later received WFCX and Burlington Northern reporting marks. They were built in 1966, and as of the 1995 Official Railway Equipment Register, 48 of the cars remained. Today, I'm guessing there are none left. You may have noticed the white Union Pacific mechanical reefers with the reporting mark ARMN somewhere down the line. Like many rail cars crisscrossing this country, these cars have quite an interesting history behind them. ARMN reporting mark is that of the American Refrigerator Transit Company co-founded in 1881 by the Missouri Pacific and the Wabash Railroads and later the Norfolk and Western. Somewhere around 1971 the partnership was dissolved and all of the ART's refrigerator cars, at least those that had the private company reporting marks, were given fresh reporting marks that did not end with the letter X. In the case of the mechanical refrigerator cars, which had been lettered RMDX, they were re-lettered ARMN. This was the first use of the reporting mark which ended in the 1980s when all of the remaining ARMN cars were re-lettered into a UPFE number series. The reporting mark was resurrected for the rebuilt former Fruit Growers Express mechanical reefers, now Chilled Express cars in the ARMN 900,000 number series. It later spread to rebuilt UPFE and Ventura County cars now in the ARMN 700,000 number series and has been applied to new equipment. I'm talking about the big cars in the 110,000 and 111,000 number series. In 2006, RailX LLC launched service in partnership with the Union Pacific Railroad and CSX between Wallula, Washington and Rotterdam, New York followed in 2008 by a Delano, California to New York Lane and Jacksonville, Florida service from the West Coast in 2014. RailX runs unit trains of 55 large Plate F refrigerated cars. Two additional refrigerated unit train services were announced in 2013, the Green Express from Tampa, Florida to Kingsbury, Indiana operated by CSX and the Tampa Port Authority and the Transcold Express operated by McKay Transcold LLC and BNSF connecting the California Central Valley with the Midwest. The Union Pacific Ice Cold Express was an all-refrigerated train that ran from Wallula, Washington to Schenectady, New York, carrying about 55 refrigerated cars full of fruits and vegetables to the RailX facility in Rotterdam. It ran the entire cross-country journey with Union Pacific's newest six-axle, highest-horsepower diesels and is shown here on December 27, 2011, two days after Christmas, at the RailX facility in Rotterdam with the Gola Price Chopper Supermarkets Distribution Center in the background. In 2017, Union Pacific and Watco's East Idaho Railroad were making investments in a refrigerated rail business that moves produce and other food products from the West Coast to upstate New York. This rail service begins in Wallula, Washington on the UP. The refrigerated cars then pass through Oregon before picking up outbound reefer cars from Watco's East Idaho Railroad at Pocatello, Idaho. The train then highballs for Chicago where it is interchanged to CSX for shipment to Syracuse, New York and ultimately Rotterdam, New York. The service is called the Cold Connect and was previously known as the Food Train. Ice Cold Express maybe? And we'll see improvements that make rail service more competitive with truckers like me and benefit Idaho's potato farmers in the process. Back in the 1990s on the Southern Pacific in San Antonio, Texas, my old stomping ground, endless parades of Fruit Growers Express reefers and insulated boxcars move back and forth over the Sunset Route. These cars are difficult, if not impossible, to spot today, but have a very interesting story behind them. In 1982, Fruit Growers Express, or FGE, owned by CSX, needed to repair and upgrade their 20-year-old existing fleet of RBL boxcars. Those are insulated plug-door cars with movable load dividers. 
about 2,500 of these RBL cars were supposed to be retrofitted with a modified load divider system as well as installing Chimply fiberglass resistant lining to the sidewalls and upgrading the cushion underframe and the plug door system. That was a lot. The new refurbished RBL cars were a fraction of the price of new cars, $12,000 versus $60,000 in those days. These rebuilt cars were said to be as good as gold and as solid as a new car. To market these new cars to shippers, FGE had the new cars repainted with a 3D looking scheme that read solid gold. The first prototype out of shop in Alexandria, Virginia was to be stenciled solid gold on the right side. During stenciling, however, part of the G had slipped and the horizontal leg of the G was missing, therefore making it look like a C. The stencil blunder gave FGE the idea to market their mechanical reefer cars in a companion-like fashion to the Solid Golds, and at that moment, the name Solid Cold was born. In 1987, CSX replaced their marketing director with someone new, and in an effort to establish his own identity, he changed the Solid Cold to Real Cold. About 50 cars were repainted in this new scheme and the concept and the individual behind it were both laughed off the property. As another interesting note, in 1983, FGE retrofitted 50 RPL cars for Stroh's Beer in which they installed a 20,000 gallon stainless steel tank for moving product at a protected temperature. These 50 cars had the Chiller logo in the same script as the solid cold cars. During later years and subsequent changes in ownership, Solid Coals began to bear reporting marks such as SFLC, BNFE, ARMH, and UPFE. These days, catching a solid cold is like finding a piece of hay in a needle stack. The majority of solid coals have been retired or upgraded to meet new interchanging rules. Rumor has it that many of the solid coals have been refurbished into the new Union Pacific Chilled Express cars like we talked about earlier. But that is another story. For Trains 21, Call me AC.